when they began their explorations in the Middle East, they found in Babylonia and Assyria and that whole area of Iraq thousands of tablets inscribed in cuneiform. You look at it, what does it mean? And there were monuments inscribed in cuneiform. So some scholars started to work on it. Now, George Rawlinson decided he wants to break it or crack it. And uh, he knew many of the languages, fluent in Greek and in uh, Latin and in Persian also and in Arabic. And um, he also knew there was this great inscription, it's called the Behistun inscription, which is on the face of a, of a stone, it's a cliff, it's on the face of a stone 250 feet above the ground. The emperor had made that inscription, it was a gigantic inscription with pictures and, and inscriptions in three sections. And Rawlinson, the first thing he did was to climb to the top of that mountain and tie a harness around himself and lower himself to the level of the inscriptions. And then he made copies of them with paper mache. He simply took wet paper and stuck it into the inscriptions and covered the entire thing. When he removed it, he had the negative impression. And then he made a positive impression, he began to work on it, and he picked one of them had an inscription with something like three or four hundred different symbols. Another one had an inscription also with several hundred symbols. And one inscription had an inscription in which there were only 60 symbols, less than or 90, less than 100. He guessed that this is Persian. And then he began to work on it. And knowing the Herodotus history, he knew that the uh, the emperor Cyrus had ancestors, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and their names in Greek are histaspes in several generations. He saw several combinations of elements which were identical, and he guessed that these are the names of this king whose name reappears several times. And also knew that in Persian it was not histaspes, but vishtaspu, okay. He began to work on it. And without going into too much detail, it took him several years before he was able to figure out the meanings of these symbols. And then, knowing Persian, he was able to reconstruct the Persian inscription. Then he went to work on the Babylonian inscription. And using the parallels, he was able to figure out the pronunciation of the names in Babylonian. And then knowing these, he was able to figure out a few more words. Now since Babylonian is related to Hebrew, he was able to figure out more. Simply put, it took him 20 years. After 20 years, he said he can read Babylonian cuneiform. And that means 20 years of research and breaking his energy on that. And it turned out that he was able to read Babylonian cuneiform. At the same time, there was a German high school teacher who had some Babylonian inscriptions on uh, bricks or tablets. And he was breaking his <laughs> pencils and, for 20 years. And he also deciphered Babylonian cuneiform. So after that, they were able to read Babylonian cuneiform. Now, they came to the other set of inscriptions. Elamite couldn't translate it because it's not related to any known language. So they had to struggle with it. Then they came to these hundreds of tablets in Sumerian. Now there they had help. They had a bilingual. Because the Babylonians used to make dictionaries of the Sumerian language with the parallel translations into Babylonian. And then they began to read the Sumerian on the basis of the Babylonian bilinguals. And then they said, well, we can actually understand Sumerian. And gradually, again, it took them another 20 or 30 years, probably more, until they were able to read Sumerian. So of the great Sumerian scholars, there was Professor Thorkel Jakobsen uh, and uh, Samuel Kramer and a man by the name of Wolfram von Soden. And they were able to 
read Sumerian, and finally, because of many bilinguals and the context itself, they, they knew that they knew how to read Sumerian. Now, when Professor Kramer said he could speak Sumerian, of course he meant I can read Sumerian, and my pronunciation may be far off. But Sumerian can be read, again, on the basis of these efforts that were made, including the bilinguals, which are a great help. When it comes to Egyptian, it was even easier even though there it took him 20 years to read Egyptian and hieroglyphics, but he started out with a bilingual, that is, with an inscription in two languages. And uh, this has happened several times. In fact, back in uh, about 40 years ago, uh, they discovered a, a very large inscription in two languages. One was Phoenician, which I can read, anybody can read Phoenician, and the other one was in Hittite hieroglyphic which was a puzzle. But now they had a bilingual, and so they were able to decipher Hittite hieroglyphic, although they'd been making progress for a while, but this was the big one, the big one.